Shabach. Shavuot Tov to everyone and welcome to Destinations Kirib Training Program. It's great to be here tonight with all of you from all across Eretz Yisrael. Many guys from England, across America, maybe even some Canadians in the room like myself. And it's great to have everyone here. We've got two unbelievable classes tonight. The first one is from Michal Zalman Dubov, who you may have heard his name, may not have heard his name. He's beginning to really take the scene as an Asia Torah giant, and his name is spreading as one of the Bali Chuba himself. He'll be giving a class later in the session, one of the only speakers that will speak twice about his own personal story when he gives a Kirov class. You see, this seminar is divided into two parts. We have the Amuna part, which are the Ashkafas, how do I know Hashem exists? How do I know that God really wrote the Torah? How do I know the oral Torah is really true? Why do bad things happen to good people? It's packaged in a way that you can give over to others and engage others in a conversation about it, but it's also mechazek, it also strengthens ourselves. I can't even tell you how many people have told me through this program that more than what it gave them to give over to others, it strengthened their own emuna. that was mechazek, their own avodah Hashem, and it complemented everything we do in yeshiva all day long, learning Torah and going closer to the Torah. Tonight, Michal Zalman Dubov, Dubov is going to give a class on evidence of Hashem's existence. Followed by that, Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, a very short break, because it's starting a little later tonight. Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, aged Kirov legend, will be giving a class on the psychology of a Kirov encounter. That's the second component of the curriculum. That's the Kirov training tools, understanding what non religious people are looking for, understand the nature of the encounter. Breaking down the barriers, giving tools of do's and don'ts. What are people looking for in life? What's the difference between Eastern spiritualities and Torah Judaism? A class on that from the great Rosh Bar Cohen. As well as a class on Kirov Krovrim, Jews that were religious that temporarily went off, and many others. So two parts of the curriculum. One part is the Amuna and the Hashkafa. The other part is the Kirov training and the tools that you'll get in an eight-part series. Tonight is the first night, which means only after this, there's only seven more from now until right after Purim, which is less, if you look at the schedule, than 50% of the Motzei Shabbosim from now until then. It's great honor to call upon Rebichol Zalman Dubov to give the first class of Destinations this year on evidence of Hashem's existence. Amazing. Good luck. Shavuot to everybody. Such a beautiful introduction. Can everybody hear me all right if I don't use this microphone? Yeah? We're all a family here also. Since we're all a family, so there's no need to add any kind of, uh, you know, you don't have to be too formal. No separations here. Okay? So if anything that I say is unclear, you want me to clarify a particular point that I said, you could just shout it out. Rabbi Dubav, can you just clarify this point or I didn't quite understand that okay there's no need to raise your hand because I might miss you or whatever the case is and I'll be able to handle whether or not it's on the point and therefore yes if I know the answer or if I know how to articulate it I will try if I don't then I'll, I would love to uh, maybe get you a Mara Makom to look at in order to, to hopefully get that answer okay if it's off the topic you're raising your hand while I'm saying don't raise your hand one second uh, if it's off the topic if it's off the topic then I would love to speak to you right afterwards, okay? Or I'll give you my email, I'll put it up on the board, okay? And everybody's welcome to email me or WhatsApp me or however you communicate. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. We're basically going to be this. No, forget basically. We are going to be discussing now the most important topic, the most important question that's possible to even ask. How do we really know there's a God? 
and I am shaking in trepidation to even give such a topic to B'nai Torah here, or I see Loim De Torah. Um, sometimes I feel like it might feel a little even silly to discuss such a thing, but it's so, so important. Because, as the Rambam writes in the third of the mitzvahs, in Sefer HaMitzvahs, Avas Hashem, the Rambam writes that just like when you love something, a favorite band, Zusha dropped a new album, right? So you start talking about it with all your boys. You, went, you found a new spot in Yerushalayim, the Heksha's all right, and the food's off the hook. So you tell people about it. Nowadays with social media, for sure, if you're on that, so you're posting things left and right. Things that you love, you want other people to love it too. You want other people to experience it as well. So all the more so, the Rambam writes that if a person understands and has tasted, experienced, heard, so to speak, God, the Creator and Sustainer of the Universe Himself, then the true sign, if you love God or not, is that you will reach out to people and speak about Him blast that out there. Obviously in a normal and mature and sophisticated and relatable way, you will speak about Hashem constantly. And what I find so much is that in people of the highest madrigas of learning even sometimes, Hashem is not in the picture. So I want to commend you first of all on on striving to reach the highest madrigas known to man, like Avram Avinu, that Hashem called him Avram Oavi. He loved me. To love Hashem is the highest level. Greater than Yerush, Yerush Hashem. It's Avas Hashem. As the Ramban writes there, the positive mitzvahs show Avas Hashem. So just very important to point this out. Talking about Hashem is a very healthy and positive thing. And we're going to be talking about Hashem a lot right now. Okay? So that's number one. Um, number two is besides reaching such lofty heights as being an Oy of Hashem, even if you don't look at yourself in that way that you're striving to reach such a level. Let's talk halacha l'maysa. We're all showing Torah here. The mitzvah of emuna of anochi Hashem elokecha. As the Rishonim bring it down, the way to actually fulfill that mitzvah, according to most Rishonim, and by most I mean just about everybody that I've seen personally, that I've heard about, I've looked into this topic a little bit myself, it's not enough just to believe in Hashem, so to speak. Imuna doesn't mean belief in Hashem. It's much more than that. And according to everybody, except for the Chinuch, I'll write it down, you have to know with evidence, clear-cut evidence, that you have to know Hashem exists and is the infinite source of all existence. You have to know the universe is created from nothing. You have to know that He alone created and continues to create everything. You have to know that He directs the world down to the most minute detail. You have to know that our purpose is to connect to Him by doing His will. And according to the Smag and a few others, you have to know that He gave us the Torah at Har Sinai, and that Torah is the same Torah that we have today, just to be Yotzi the mitzvah of Anochi Hashem Elokecha. It's Taryag mitzvahs here. So seriously, as you take your tefillin and your tzitzis, all the more so, the foundation of everything, right? Forget about, forget about Reishi's Chachma, Yiras Hashem. We're talking about Reishi's everything, knowing there's Hashem. Yeah? Okay. The Chinuch says, you know what? You're Yotzi, Bidi Yavid. You're Yotzi the Mitzvah. If you just go along with your Mesorah, your father told you there's Hashem, so you believe Him. He has no reason to lie to you. It makes sense that God exists, so you believe. And you consider yourself a Mamin. However, even the Chinuch writes that mitzvah in a muvchar, not only to believe, but to understand evidence, to speak about it with others, and to even be able to die, rather than even say, no, I think Hashem doesn't exist. Okay? Okay. He didn't hear any evidence yet. Okay, so here we go. He's like, I got this. I just realized it's in my pocket. I'm out. Okay, so check it out. So let's begin. Let's begin with the first argument, the first piece of evidence. There's no proof, by the way. If you're looking for 100% proof, it doesn't exist. You should just know that, going into it. And you should be able to tell that to people, that there is no proof. And that's how Ashkaf HaShmu is all on its own. But let's talk about the first piece of evidence. The first piece of evidence that I consider to be very, very powerful, if not the most powerful piece of evidence, is called the first cause argument. Where in the world did this universe come from? Okay? 
So just a little bit of background on this because it's important. Nowadays, we almost take it for granted, but it's super important to know this for yourselves and it's really important to point it out to others, especially others who claim to be very much scientifically uh, in the loop, okay? So until 1912... The scientific world was at odds with the world of theologians, with the believers, so to speak, okay? Until 1912, the overwhelming majority of people in the world who weren't Judeo-Christian or Hindus, right? Even pagan cultures, which there are plenty of still today, believe that the universe always existed. It's called the static state model of the universe. The universe always existed, it's an infinite universe, it's infinitely old, it's infinitely big. They had no clue, okay? And this was the commonly held theory from the times of Aristotle and before. What's the name again? Static state model of the universe, okay? Is it possible to close the door? It's all right? Thank you so much. I have worse ADD than everybody here put combined, so thanks. Okay, so that's number one. Now... Until somebody by the name of Vesto Slipher, he was an American astronomer, he discovered in his, in his telescope that spiral galaxies in the distance were red shifting. They were moving away from him, from his point of observation. That's interesting. He saw they were moving away fairly quickly, too. But it wasn't until 1924 that the math had been done and further observations came to show that the universe was indeed expanding. Once they did the math, they realized that the universe is expanding at a rate faster than the speed of light. Now, nothing in the universe, nothing in space and time moves faster than the speed of light or can move faster than the speed of light. But space and time itself was stretching beyond that rate. Now, that that might not mean anything to you, but that's an astonishing thing. And this is exactly what Albert Einstein was fighting because his theory of relativity essentially led to such a conclusion and it wasn't proven until 1964. 19, he saw, first of all, 1912, they saw that the universe is expanding. They didn't know how fast. They thought maybe it's a blip. Maybe it's an oddity. But in 1924, the math had been done, and they show it, it's expanding beyond, uh, it's, it's incomprehensible how quickly it is. And if it's expanding that quickly, that means that at one point, you know, just rewind the tape. You know, folks, let's see the beginning, you know. What's going to be at the beginning? They, is it inverse? I mean, what happens in the beginning? They realize there's a beginning if it's expanding. They played with theories called oscillating theory universe. Maybe, no, it's still infinite like we always said. Okay, it's not so static. It always existed, but it goes like this. Right? But then they realize there's not enough energy in the universe. They can calculate such things. There's not enough energy in the universe to actually make it come back and then explode again. And this famous Big Bang Theory that we know of, you might know of it in our circles as Bereshis, right? Um, in 1964, with the discovery of something called cosmic microwave background radiation, all of a sudden now, what's muskam in the world of scientists and the world of would-be atheists is that the, this universe had a beginning. And if there's a beginning, you might say there's a beginner. But it's not so posh. Unfortunately, it's not so simple as that, okay? However, everybody agrees that time and space itself, there was a point when that didn't be- exist. Okay? Now, science has no working theories or models as to what was before time and space. Where time and space came from, no clue whatsoever, but they can track it down fairly accurately. Now, this might be a controversial point, but I think stick around in Destinations, you'll see how it's not so controversial. And there's really no, there's no steer between real deal bona fide science and Torah, because Torah is MS. And if the scientists arrive at the MS, then it can't be a contradiction with the Torah. So we're going to go with the number about 15 billion years ago, give or take a few hundred million years. Every scientist who's accepted in, in circles in intellectual academies knows that there was a beginning around then. Before that, they have no clue. Now, we've known that for 3,332 years ago, ever since Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us the Torah, and in the Midbar, we learned Bereshis. And before that, like, like Rav Rosen and Levi said, Shevet Levi was learning Bereshis, and we all knew that. And Avram Avinu himself discovered it and deduced it logically. Now, let's just go through the logical progression here. This is the argument that Richard Dawkins, nowadays the most outspoken atheist out there, almost militant in his nature, and we'll see some interesting quotes about Richard Dawkins from his peers 
as we go through this right now, but he is, is on tape saying that this, what we're going to go through right now, this simple regression, he calls it this, this infinite regression, is the most dangerous thing to the world of atheists out there. He doesn't actually know how to refute it logically. His only refutation is that since I can't fathom where everything came from, so it must not exist. I'm not joking. It sounds ridiculous. But he's actually on tape saying this. He writes this in his books. And it just shows you the level of emotions and gaiva and pride and ego that we're dealing with. It's not intellectual. It's not intellectual at all. You have to remember that. And we'll talk at the end if we have time about that, okay? Repeat that last point, what he said. He said, since I can't fathom what was in this regression, which we'll go through right now, so it must not exist. Because how could it exist if my mind can't understand it? Have you ever heard anything so guy with dick in your life? Okay. Imagine saying to your Rebbe, Rebbe, your tarots and tosos can't be right because I can't, I can't get shot. So you must be wrong. Okay, let's go through it. Everything in this world is finite. Okay? It can be measured. It has bounds. It has limits. It has lackings. It's here. That means by nature it's not there. Okay? So everything in this world is finite. Okay? The universe, therefore... The conclusion was, is also finite. Okay. Now, everything in this universe is cause and effect. And therefore, we view the universe, which is itself finite, as the effect, so to speak, Did of something. Yes. Great question. So this is a theological argument that, that, that the Greek philosophers go through. If everything that we observe in the universe is cause and effect, so then how, how do you go back to the static state model where, every, where it always existed? So their answer was, with some fancy footwork, it's called turtles all the way down. They actually believe that this universe, it's infinitely big. Now, obviously, there's no conception of infinity here, but and it's, it's resting on the back of a giant turtle. We won't waste our time on this. And they asked, well, what's, what's that turtle standing on? They said, another turtle. And what's that turtle standing on? Another turtle. They asked and asked and asked. He said, turtles all the way down. Okay? That's the concept, basically. Okay? Okay. It's difficult to speak about it, and it's so simple, but people, when their emotions are in the way, they can't understand this. But let's just go through it one time very quickly, and then we'll stop for, for a question to clarify. So everything in this universe is cause and effect. So therefore, anything that's finite is the effect of something else that's also finite. This universe is finite, therefore it's the effect of something else. The effect of What? Whatever you say, if that's finite, then that also has a cause. You hear that? If it's measurable, if it can be defined, if you can even speak about it with positive Lashonos, then it's not something else because it's that which you're saying to me now. So where did that come from? And where did that come from? So whatever caused all finite space and therefore time to come into existence must itself be non-finite. Anything that caused the finite space to come into existence must itself, by definition, not be finite. Because otherwise, you'd ask on that, well, what caused that to come into existence? Why not the infinite turtles? Oh, great. So, infinite turtles. I didn't want to go there, but let's just talk about it for a second. Whenever we talk about infinity in mathematics, right, we're not actually discussing the concept called infinity. We're actually just saying something that our brains can wrap our, our, our conceptual minds around. And that is, we put down a marker and we're starting all over again. Meaning when we say in mathematics something approaches infinity, right? Then it's just a theoretical infinity. It didn't really get there yet, right? I'll give you another example. If I had a ball, right? This is a classic example. If I had a ball that was this big, let's say. It started this big. And every half a second, it would double in size, okay? And it would swallow everything inside of it. Okay? So let's say in five hours from now, do you realize this ball would be huge? It would be bigger than our solar system, and in t- ten hours from now, it would be bigger than this whole galaxy, and, in, and let's say in a month from now, right, it would be so big, it would, it would be bigger than the bounds of the universe as scientists are able to calculate it nowadays. So if I ask you, is that ball infinite? What would you say? No, because it still has a border, right? We don't know what's outside that border. We can't conceptualize it, but it still has a border. I know because it's expanding. I can calculate rates and things like that. Okay, so therefore, but is it potentially infinite? 
It's kind of like a funny question. Uh, you want to say yes, right? So, so philosophically, we'll just say yes. It's potentially infinite. But real infinity means without bounds. It means that everything in this universe, if time and space was infinite, would have already existed and everything in time would have already occurred. Very difficult to wrap your brains around. That's why I didn't want to really go there, but think about it. If, if true infinity means that everything that already that would exist that's possible to exist would have already existed and everything that could happen would have already happened what do you mean by everything that could happen true but it happens again infinite infinite means all all encompassing so it happens again and again and again and again so we're the 6000 years whatever you're saying so we're inside of that model Then this conversation already happened again. It's something for which we can't have evidence to. And that's what we'll get to right now. That's what we'll get to in a second. I hear the point. Yeah. We'll get to that. We'll get to how, how the atheist tries to get out of this. They use a different version of this. And I'll explain it in one second. Okay? Okay. So going back within measurable, within measurable time and space. Okay? So... Everything in this world has a, co- uh, has a cause and therefore has an effect, right? So what is the first cause of this universe? If you go back to it, whatever it is, if it's finite, then that also had a cause, okay? So we, we have to say that this universe came into existence from something that is non-finite. There has to be an end to this infinite regression. Otherwise, we get into this problem, which we'll philosophically solve in one second, I think, okay? And that is... The, uh, okay, fine. So, right... So whatever this force is, it has to be non-finite, meaning it can't exist in space, and it can't exist in time, because actually time is just the measured, measured um, rate of change in this universe. Meaning what, when things are completely frozen, when things are at absolute zero, so there's no time. Okay? Because if there's no change, then there's no time. So time began when this universe right, started moving, so to speak. The first particle started moving, that's when time began. That's why people age differently in, in different gravities, right? Different planets. You know, you age slower on the moon. Why is that? Because your body moves, right? The molecules move at a different rate, at a slower rate, in a different gravitational pull. We'll get to gravity in a second, okay? So therefore, therefore, um, time is really just observable change in matter. That's, it doesn't exist unto itself. There's no such thing as man, at least in the scientific vocabulary, that exists unto itself. Okay? Okay. And therefore, whatever created this first, the first particles, right, the first matter, had to have been not material, not from matter, and, what, and whatever then got the ball rolling in time, meaning caused it to move, itself must have been, so to speak, motionless, right? Or a, outside of time as we know it because there was no matter. It created matter. Okay? Clear? Again? Okay. It's okay? It's okay. It's, we're dealing with very finite things. I think they make sense, barring this question, and we'll get to this question in a second. Okay. This universe, everything in it, is time and space. Okay? Space being matter. Things that take up dimensions. Okay? Whatever created matter itself could not have been itself made of matter. Otherwise, you just ask, where did that come from? And then you didn't really answer the question. Okay? Time is defined as observable change in matter. Only when you have matter, when you have stuff, and that stuff is changing, can you measure time. Before there was change, there was no time. Okay? And therefore, whatever created the first matter which science admits had to have been created because this universe is expanding. And in the beginning, they call it a singularity that it was completely compacted, everything that ever existed, into one point. Okay? 
It had to not been material, could not take up any space, because it caused space to come into existence, and it, by definition, had to be outside of time, because there couldn't be change without matter. So there was no change, there was no time, and there was no space. Okay? Okay. What? That point isn't space. That point is space. That's the problem. The scientists have no idea where that point came from. Okay? Now, let's get to the refutations really quickly. One refutation is the following. No, you misunderstand. Even though matter as we know it nowadays had a point of emanation, was created, matter as we know it nowadays was created. However, okay, a physicist by the name of Lawrence Krauss put a book out few years ago, literally called the universe from nothing. He says we don't need the first cause argument, and we're not afraid of the first cause argument, because what that piece of matter came from was something that was immaterial. It was not matter. It was not made of stuff. Rather, it was made of waves. And we know there's a difference between waves and stuff. It's a different conversation for quantum. But the point is, is that and those waves, he calls them quantum fluctuations, caused that first matter to come into existence. So boom! So what you're saying is exactly that. We'll get to that. That's design. We'll get to that in a second, okay? But I find this one to be the most powerful. Why? Because anything that they say that you can say, no, we're not afraid of the beginning because there was something before the beginning of matter called quantum fluctuations. You ask on that, do quantum fluctuations have patterns of behavior? Yes. Okay. I mean, they're waves, they're frequencies, they're, yes. They have a, they, they, they cause something. To, yes. So then th- that's finite. So then what caused that to come into existence? And it's Lawrence Krauss, a Jew, okay? You can look into it. Um, his, his book has amazing reviews from the, from the atheist, uh, new atheist world and from most scholars, including literary critics in even Columbia University. Uh, it's ripped apart because of this simple fallacy. It's a logical fallacy, okay? It's not about stuff. It's about anything that I can define that has, that has um, d- a definable range of characteristics is by definition finite and therefore it had to have also a beginning. Why is it by definition finite? Because the fact that we can talk about it, we can discuss it, we can say it's like this and not like this means it's lacking. If it's lacking, that means it has boundaries. If it has boundaries, that means it was, right, at one point it did not exist. How's he answering the question of the beginning if all he's saying is that some way you've made it? He's saying because the problem that we get into is with things that we can observe, right? Things in the observable world that, that's material, that has a density. That, the singularity, without going into too deep, is, is all the matter in the world existed in one point, right? And from that, it exploded when it got too hot, right? Whatever, what made it so hot? What made it, oh, quantum fluctuations, right? Some kind of waves, not particles, and therefore you escape this problem. The problem is that waves themselves are also finite. And they have to come from a source as well. No waves in the universe come from no source whatsoever. Okay? Okay. Enough scientific jargon for now that is probably above all of our heads, myself included. Okay? But I'll get to the way out, number two. Way out number two is called multiverse. Multiverse means that you're right. This universe had to have a beginning. And we're stuck. But if there are infinite amounts of universes, right then we don't have this problem. Another, yeah, it's like, what, it's like, it's, what's your name? It's, it's like what Yitzhak's saying. Everything that already happened, already happened, and, <laughs> and therefore this conversation already happened. Already, okay, great, but th- we're still finite, and therefore you're in this bubble of finite possibilities, but still, again, finite can't come out of nowhere. It doesn't just appear randomly by itself. How does it answer, how does it answer the question? I mean, it doesn't, I thought it It doesn't, it doesn't. It's just a new conceptual way of saying turtles all the way down. I, I agree with you. It doesn't answer the question. You're going to hear this again and again. We're going to go through some other things and you're going to think, think to yourself, how, how could they still say no? But that, that's what, I'm not arguing the other side. And I, I don't possibly fully understand the other side. Okay? Okay. Because uh, it's like... We're in this infinite, uh, we're inside the infinite regression, and therefore we, we don't know what came first. And, and there's other universes out there. We still, still have the point where we're saying we don't know. It's still not an I agree. Right. I agree. Yeah. Why can't all these universes come from nothing? Because 
nothing in this world comes from nothing. Everything in this universe comes from something. Everything comes from something. Do you think that it's because in these multiverses, whatever, like the one way in is still finite? Yes, yes. The only way in, the only output is finite. Output's always finite. So what's the so what's the input? If it's finite, so what's the input? What's the input? What's the input? Okay. Okay. Can we move on to the next point? Okay. Fine. The next point is what's your name? Yosef. Yosef mentioned the watch. Okay, this is William Paley, an 18th century English philosopher's famous watchmaker argument, which is you're walking in a forest and you find a rock on the floor, you pick up the rock. You look at it, you think to yourself, where did this rock come from? So without going into all this, these thoughts that we can't really fathom, you might think, oh, it was always there. You walk a little bit further, you find a watch on the floor, an iPhone, whatever the case is, right? You look at it and you say, oh, it was always there. You wouldn't say that. You would say clearly, this had a point of origin, right? And somebody, not only was it created, not only did it, did it come into existence at a, at a time that I can that I can wrap my brain around, but that, that actually was designed, it was created with knowledge for a purpose, right? So the argument goes like this, that if a watch, which clearly has a purpose, right, and was designed to tell time, for instance, to wear on your arm or in your pocket or whatever the case is, that was created by a mind, right? So to the universe was also created, or a human eye was created, because it's much more complex and it's clearly fulfilling purpose. Everything in nature fulfills a purpose. Nothing is without purpose. Nothing. Nothing is without purpose. People say, oh, the appendix. They figured out that one out too by now. Everything has a purpose. Everything accomplishes something. Everything has a vital task. So therefore, that's the, that's the Kalva Homer. Okay? Okay. Fine. In the last 50 years, the world of science has begun to recognize the latent designs, the hidden design in everything, in all fields of existence from mathematics to chemistry, biology, astronomy, cosmology, they're realizing that there are certain constants, there are certain constraints in the world that are so perfectly, seemingly tuned, fine-tuned and designed that it can't be a coincidence. Any one of them unto itself could be a coincidence, but there's so many things in this world, so many constants, so many... um, um, it's called the anthropic principle, okay? Okay, so here's some examples of it, okay? The examples are like this. Everything in this world follows something called the law of entropy. The law of entropy states that everything in this world is constantly in a state of chaos and decay. Everything is breaking apart, okay? Everything is constantly breaking. We look at it, we see it as aging, okay? Radiation, right, is everything... Um, all molecules are falling apart. Everything in this universe is falling apart. Everything's moving away from itself, falling apart. You see that? The anthropic principle. You could look into it. The anthropic principle basically states by scientists, most of them not believers, that everything in this universe seemingly has a design to it. There's a lot of constants in nature that seem to be fine-tuned. Okay? Okay. When they, st- when they saw, discovered one or two, so it wasn't the biggest deal. But over the last 50 years, they discovered dozens and dozens of these that if any of them were different, we wouldn't have a, a universe that's structured. We wouldn't have a platform for life. We wouldn't have um, a-, a home. We wouldn't have an arena for life at all. But not just that there would be chaos, there would be completely almost like nothing. And there would definitely not be any life. So that's an that's a easy refutation right there, that if you have infinite dice rolling, the only one that's going to stay is the one that's perfect. Yeah, so we'll get into that in one second. But let me just go through the argument and we'll get to the refutations, okay? So the argument goes like this, that in a world where entropy rules supreme, that everything's constantly breaking apart, okay, then how are there such constants such as gravity, atomic um, forces, strong forces, weak forces, electromagnetic strong forces, weak forces, the cohesive properties of water, that water somehow sticks together when most liquids don't stick together. The fact that water, um, when it freezes, it expands, thereby floating to the, to the surface of the water, the body of water, as opposed to many other liquids, most other liquids that just sink because they, when they freeze, they become more dense, so they sink down to the bottom. And all of these things 
um, play a role in the formation of stars, in the formation of galaxies and planets and solar systems and all that. And without each of these constants being perfectly aligned the way that they are right now, they measured it to crazy decimal rates. It's not even worth speaking about. It's just like the chances of this happening, right, so to speak, randomly, um, are virtually impossible. When I say virtually impossible, I mean I have to give credit that, yes, there's a number that's represented by the chance that it could be random, but that number is so astronomically small that in anything else we say it's zero. It's impossible. So it's impossible that this whole universe could have been tuned this way. Okay? Not only just universal fine-tuning, even things just here specifically for Earth are just crazy fine-tuned, such as things like the distance from the, from, of the Earth from the Sun. I'm sure you've heard all these things before. The axis at which the Earth is spinning, right? Um, all, the speed at which the Earth is spinning, the distance of the Moon away from the Earth stopping the oceans from flooding us, right? I mean, countless factors, okay? Now, I'll just read you a few quotes. Can I just do that? A few quotes. It goes like this. Um, Professor Freeman Dyson of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton says the following, As we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy we have worked together to our, that have worked together to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe must be in some sense have known we were coming. Another quote, okay, this is from a Nobel Prize winner in physics. He says, Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which is created out of nothing, one with very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life. Okay? It seems like there's a supernatural plan. I find it, the next quote, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence. Why there is something instead of nothing. That's from Alan Sandage, a a Crawford Prize winner in astronomy. So these are people that claim not to believe. They even said the words, the universe that came from nothing. And yet, I think that we can see that it's illogical to say the universe came from nothing. I believe so. And if you want to not say that, you want to say that we're living inside of this infinite regress right now, and it, it truly is an infinite regress, that's something that you can't prove. You can't show evidence for that. Because if you're just going to tell me, well, this already happened already, everything that already happened, happened already. So then how do I explain, well, the universe is expanding, it has boundaries. Oh, because we live inside of one of m- countless universes that are expanding. But really, everything already happened again, which kind of goes back to you. Meaning, if everything already happened again, and we're just living through it again, and it's all infinite, so then why do we measure boundaries of our universe? This is what I wanted to say. It wasn't coming to my mind before. And that is, well, we know that this universe didn't already happen again. Everything inside of this universe did not already happen again. Oh, you're right, but there's, there's infinite universes where this already happened again. So now you're talking about parallel universes. You're talking about m- many places where we exist, where this did happen already, because it's at a different rate of expansion, and all kinds of crazy things that may be true, but there's no way to prove it or disprove it. And therefore, when we're looking inside of this universe, we have to go with the numbers, and the numbers say that the way the universe was designed, just in order to have planets, forget about life, and then on top of that, the astronomical numbers that that are out there that you can find, I'll give you more Macomos, for the actual chances of life developing are so astronomically small you have to say it's impossible. If you say it's impossible, then they'll say, ha-ha, you're anti-intellectual. There is a number that proves that it's possible. So you show them the number, and there's not enough numbers, there's not enough space in the whole world on, on which to write that number. So they're banking on that instead of just saying, you know, there was a beginning means there was a beginner. There's a design in this universe means there's a designer. This universe was created means there's a creator. They don't want to say that. Okay, and that's why I have a whole database for one of the rabbis here um, is is collecting and 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 storing and and docking quotes from famous scientists. And not he doesn't put just anybody. He doesn't just put some professor at some community college. He just he's putting only the greatest scientific minds out there. Lahavdio, like the Rabbana that everyone would learn about. You know. The, the stuff that everybody learns, and he's he's putting quotes from them. They might still be atheists, but their quotes are clearly saying, "God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence." In a universe that came from nothing, it seemed like it was expecting us. I mean, these quotes are just so radical that it doesn't make sense. It's it's almost silly to at this point not believe. But again, we're not looking for belief. We're looking for knowledge as best as we could, and um, yeah. One more thing. This is a great quote on the multiverse. If you don't want God, you better have a multiverse. That's a quote by another 
professor. Yeah. So you're. It's so crazy to say all those things that you're saying. It's not crazy to say there's a God, but there's no concrete proof. So when you look at the word proof, you're right. If I were to get up here and say I have proof of God's existence, you could say I'm crazy. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the math is pointing to design and a designer. The logic that we see in the observable universe is saying that everything that's finite comes from something else that's also finite. So where did this universe come from? Something that's finite? Well, then where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? If you want to say it's infinite again, so then you run into the problem of everything already happened and everything that we just spoke out. So you have to believe in a, in a multiverse and you have to believe in that tiny, tiny chance. And when I say tiny chance, it's not like anything you can even imagine. The number is so small, you can't even imagine it. You have to believe that over just saying that there is a God, there is a creator, there is a designer. So like logically, isn't it crazy? Like, I believe in God. Like, isn't it crazy to say there is a God? No, I'm, I'm trying to show you that it's more reasonable than not to say there is a God. Just from these two points right now that we're talking about right now. Okay? Um, yeah. You guys are breaking my rules, but go for it. Yeah. I, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, okay. So maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the point here, but the idea of like entropy that, you know, at the beginning there's such a small, infinitesimal, like, like small chance that there could be created from, from nothing. But in, in a time, you said, you mentioned there's no movement, there's no time. Right. So if chance is, isn't that based off time? Like how many times can I exist? Like one out of ten, or like yes. whatever. Yes. So if there's no time, then you can like roll the dice as many times as you want until you get that number, until you get that lucky. Well, there's no dice to roll. I'm saying I still think I should like. No, it's fine. I'm not challenging. I mean, let's go. Let's talk about the argument. First of all, there's no dice to roll. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even after a primary cause, you're saying that the universe could only exist within these very specific. Exactly. Things. Right, but even so, if it couldn't exist, then it wouldn't exist, and the fact that it does, that means that it's somehow. Okay. Good. That. So. Let me say exactly the refutation that these fine gentlemen... What's your name? Benny. Benny? Yeah, talk to Benny. He seems like a very smart guy. And you're with the assist? Ellie. Ellie, okay. Ellie and Benny are basically pointing to a refutation of David Hume, a 17th, uh, an 18th century, late 1700s philosopher that says the same thing, that it's not fair to use design as a piece of evidence for the existence of a god, a designer, because in anything statistical, you have to compare it to something else. And here, we only have this universe, which means, by the way, David Hume was saying, I don't believe in God based on the lack of the design principle, but I don't have a multiverse. He's, David Hume is saying there is only one universe, because you can't say there's multi-universe, because that's not scientific. And yet, since I only have one universe, therefore, you can't use statistics to show me how improbable life is in this world, because I have nothing to compare it to. That's basically what you're saying. So that's all well and good. That's true when you don't have something that looks like design. Meaning, whenever you have an event that occurs seemingly randomly, and I'll just use this example, this is a famous example, you take a bucket of paint, you spill it at a wall, right? And it forms a bunch of splatters. So I can't say, oh, look how many, look at those, look at that perfect splatter. Wow, what are the chances of that happening? That's amazing, right? Isn't that crazy? What a miracle, right? So that's insane because that splatter, if I throw the bucket of paint 50 times, is, is equally likely to happen as any other splatter on the wall, Right? But if I throw the bucket of paint at the wall and it spells out, what's going on, Benny? How are you? Right? Then I can't say, no, it's just as equally likely to happen as any other paint splatter. Once, once design, by definition, is being invoked, once, once something that a conscious mind would do is being invoked, then you can't say that it's just as likely as anything else to happen. saying, hi, Benny, how are you doing? Then reality would collapse. Then we're saying, how, how could you possibly have any other form of paint lighting? That's the problem. That's what? He, you're saying there's only one bucket of paint and it came out this way. No, no, no. Besides for that, besides that, we're saying that if the paint would have landed on the wall and it wouldn't have said, hi, Benny, then it would have disappeared. That's essentially what we're saying. If the universe would not follow, follow these specific laws, then it would just collapse in on itself. It wouldn't be able to be constant. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have Right, exactly. No that, that, exactly. So the fact that we're saying that here, okay, so the only time that the bucket could have stayed is if it would have said, hi, Benny. But that's not necessarily saying 
that somebody is, I'm saying. Okay, so, so just really quick, you know Ellie, right? Yeah. So what Ellie's basically saying is, I, since we're not using multiverse, so we have one bucket of paint, so to speak. We only have one universe. So maybe this is just the way universes are made. Well, he's asking after the fact. Basically, you're going in reverse. You're saying that now that the world is... Yeah, yeah. Only one right. I am going in reverse, yeah. yeah. Everything we possibly do can only go in reverse. Everything you're, you're hearing right now, all this evidence is based on something that we can observe because we are stuck in space and time, right? As the creation. So, what you, you could say that. You could say, oh, it's just that's how universes are made. There's only one universe and we got lucky. But if you just show, right, that everything clearly has a design to it, then it, it seems to be, in my mind, a more reasonable thing to say let alone for the fact that wherever this one lucky universe did come from, itself can't be a finite thing, and therefore must be something that is above space and time. Clear? And it can't be an infinite regression. Again, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's what I'm saying, exactly. I'm saying, I'm saying God, but, but they're saying nobody threw it. Quantum fluctuations through it. So then you say, well, who, who, who created the, the, the one who threw that bucket of paint? That's the second argument, or the first one that we said. The teleological argument can only work as a step two. Oh, yeah, that's why, for sure. That's why, that's why right now I have five arguments that, that really you have to use. Meaning, if you're going to speak to anyone about it, it's going to always go this way. It's very important, actually. So it's always like, yeah, but maybe this. So don't say No. Don't be closed-minded and say, no, you're wrong. They're right. Maybe this, because by the fact that it's evidence and not solid proof, there has to be a maybe. There's always a way out. Human beings always have a way out. There's always a way out. Hashem is not speaking to us right now. Clearly, so there's always a way out. So you always have to say, it's true. It's true. Maybe you can bank yourself on that number. Oh, that number is out of nowhere because statistically you can't say it because we're stuck in one universe. We're stuck in one universe? So how did finite come to existence in the first place from other finite things right so they're always like oh but maybe it's a multiverse okay fine multiverse can't prove or disprove that you can believe that if you want to but there's there's other there's other um, yeah there's other pieces of evidence how much more time do we have yeah okay great yeah how can you No, no, so one second. What's your name? Ellie. Oh, another Ellie. Okay, great. So Ellie is actually saying, by the way, I just want to say, okay, we'll talk about it after. But what Ellie is basically saying is, they're only, that's, their, that's always the atheist claim. You guys have the burden of proof because I'm working with what I could observe. It's actually the exact opposite. If you, if, you just, if you just look at the arguments that I'm putting forth right now is... I'm looking at the universe as it is. I'm observing the universe and gaining principles from the universe itself. And I'm showing that just like in this universe, everything that has that is that exists has a cause to it, so to the universe has a cause to it. And whatever that cause is, it couldn't have been finite. That's what I'm saying. That, that's an observable fact. That's a logical, observable, philosophical fact. What they say is, no... Everything already, already, always existed. We've been through. We've done this dance before. There's multi. There's multi um, billions and trillions and infinite universes. As soon as they start saying things like that, then you say, "Wait, you're the one talking from empirical evidence that we can observe, or am I?" Yeah, but they, they claim to be theorizing. You claim to bring proof, but your proof exists with that, like outside of the bounds of the toolbox of reality. So they could say very easily that your proof is just like children's stories, basically. Like, so I'm not bringing proof. I'm asking questions. But you're, you're I'm not religious people. All I know, all I know is that we have evidence, one after another. I personally can think of five pieces of evidence. I would love to see more. That if if spoken out, even though there's always a maybe, but I think that it's more reasonable before the maybe. You can always say maybe. And usually the maybes are preposterous things. Like, 
Lawrence Krauss wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing because he believes it's ridiculous to say that the finite universe came from nothing. Very important to realize that. The guy who wrote the book about a universe from nothing believes it's ridiculous to say the universe came from nothing. Because philosophically, that's flawed. So he had to say that, okay, that something can't be matter, other matter, because then you'd ask me where that came from. So I'm going to show you something that's not matter. And he calls it quantum fluctuations, which he goes on and on explaining, which other quantum physicists with much more clout than him show that he has no idea what he's talking about in refutations, just in the world of his quantum theories. But philosophers just show that that's not logical because that whatever you're descri- describing itself is finite. And since you admit that the finite can't f- come from other finite, you're stuck with God. That's the problem. It's always using, using their own arguments. You're sh- they're, you're, you have to show that what you're saying might be true, but it's actually less reasonable than what I'm saying. And that's only one aspect of it. Design also. Design, you're right. I only have one universe, which means no vol- multiverse. But this universe, the way that it happened is so perfect that it's like the watch. It's like the watch. And they say it's not like the watch. So why is it not like the watch? Why is it not like the watch? Everything in nature, the more you study nature, the more you study DNA. Let's just talk about DNA for one second. DNA is ridiculous. DNA, I quote Bill Gates, right, who's kind of a big deal in computer programming. DNA is like a computer program, only much more complex than anything we've been able to design. DNA is the most complex book ever written. Okay? It's in every living life form. The chances of it happening by itself, meaning randomly, and that's once we have a universe with life forms and non-life forms, DNA Right, You can roll the dice. You can use controls because there are things in this wor- world that doesn't have DNA. Right, Rocks don't have DNA. Yeah, Immater- uh, sorry, um, Mineral things without life don't have DNA. So you can now compare. So just look at DNA alone. DNA could not have created itself. Everyone agrees to that. DNA could not have created itself. So how did DNA come into creation? So I'll just read you... Um, I'll just read you a few quotes. Okay? Here we go. The origin of life is the deepest mystery in the whole of science. This is again from Professor Freeman, who's a self-proclaimed atheist. Many books and learned papers have been written about it, but it remains a mystery. There is an enormous gap between the simplest living cell and the most complicated, naturally occurring mixture of non-living chemicals. We have no idea when and how this gap was crossed. Francis Crick, the discoverer of DNA, of the double helix model of DNA, and since then, many more amazing things about DNA have been discovered. He himself writes, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be an absolute miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. And that's before we even start examining the complexity of the DNA itself. Okay? So... You're always, we are always using the observable universe. It's the atheists who are using non-observable, non-provable, non-testable theories to latch on to nowadays. Okay? When you want to talk about um, another refutation, it's, it's evolution. So they say, you're right. Within this universe, life, the, the existence of life itself that, statistically speaking, is, is, is very difficult, right? The universe itself, they'll go on to David Hume's idea, and they won't accept the idea, designer, design equals design, designer. But they'll say that, um, you're right, life is a miracle, life is amazing, but we can explain it with evolution. So number one, they have no idea how the first cell came to be, and that's that giant gap that nobody knows how to replicate, number one. Second of all, I could, I could blast out to you guys a paper called A Summary of Why Modern Atheism Has No Intellectual Basis. It's, yeah, exactly. It's 65 pages. Rav Chaim Rosenblatt, right over here in, in the old city in Tivari, spent years and years researching this topic. And he has email correspondence with one of the greatest, um, um, you know, biochemists in the world who focuses on evolution day and night. And, I'll just read you what, what, the, uh, what his chaver in the field wrote. 
This guy, by the way, himself is an agnostic. But when it comes to evolution, I'll, set, I'll, I'll blast that out to you happily. I'll, I'll have Rabbi Rosen blast it out to you guys if you can get through the technical jargon. But listen to this. He writes like this. The scientific community c- concludes that there simply isn't enough time, given the, even the 15 billion years of the universe, for the necessary amount of mutations to have occurred to arrive at life by chance. When it comes to the leading intellectuals and the most vocal atheists, this is Professor Shapiro, his, his CV is too vast for me to even explain right now, but he writes the following. Listen to this. He's talking about the atheists who latch on to evolution to refute everything that we've just said, even though it doesn't actually refute it, because again, they can't tell you where the first cell of life came from. But he says about uh, atheists, uh, about um, the, um, the neo-Darwinists. They have a community of like-minded people They have no problem ignoring inconvenient facts because they are essentially what we call a faith-based community, a fundamentalist religious group. The power of certainty is very strong, especially when your belief system is threatened by modern technology. In this case, a technology that allows for genomics and genetic sequencing. As you say, it's a shame that the public is told this represents science, but it happens all the time. Okay, this is from the, a leading evolutionary microbiologist in the world. He has the emails. He has the email chain. You can email him to see the emails himself. He has, he's, this, this microbiologist is so sick of the literal creationists that say that the universe was created in seven days and this is how it happened and, and there is no such thing as evolution, just completely blind to the science. And he's so sick of those people that say that evolution explains everything and you don't need God for evolution, even though we don't know where the first cell came from. Their answer to that is, Well, we don't know yet. We'll know eventually. He's so sick of these two camps. These are the two camps, by the way, without Torah Shabbat Peh. He's so sick of these two camps that he created a a website, an online community of the greatest um, scientists in the field of biology. It's called The Third Way. Whereas, basically, it's just, we don't know. But it can't be either of those. And just the ability to say, I don't know, right, is a huge mila. Because everyone realizes it's pointing to God. The question is, do you feel like our friend in the back? What's your name? Elliot. And, and our, Simcha. Simcha. Like Simcha was saying, but I feel like, isn't it crazy to say it's God? So like, the, this guy is stuck. It's crazy to say it's God, but it's crazy to say that we can explain how life came to be, how this universe became to be so ordered, how there's something from that exists at all, Right? And whatever you want to call that infinite, that non-spatial, non-finite, timeless, powerful, wise entity that created this universe, that is all those things. So if you're uncomfortable with saying God, then you're stuck. So then the best thing to say is, I don't know. But it's not to say I'm an atheist and to write lots of books and to go out into the world saying there's no God, do whatever you want, it's all good, we're all going to die anyway. There's and, and Okay, and, you hear the point? The power of I don't know. There's, there's really three more um, arguments which we definitely don't have time for, but I'm just going to say what they are, okay? There's three more arguments. Now, any of these alone won't demonstrate the fact that there's a God. And none of them prove it. But together, a person is just so unreasonable if they don't yet admit that there's a God, okay? The, the next one is the national revelation at Mount Sinai. I know it sounds crazy, but... I teach the class here at H. Okay, I've been doing my own research. Dr. Gottlieb, Dr. Rabbi Gottlieb, Rabbi Dr. Gottlieb, whatever he likes to be called, is a go and autumn. He wrote a safer called Reason to Believe. Go through that yourselves. Ne- Maimon Har Sinai is a proof of God. Okay? That's number one. It's a separate class on that. Separate class, yeah. Number two is that the Torah itself could not have been written by human beings. Very important. That's the whole discovery seminar. Again, not for right now, but the Torah itself, you have a document that could not have been reasonably written by a human being. Ad Khan. Okay? So, you're right, Rabbi, but it could have been aliens. I'm not joking. At the end of discovery seminar, there are people that come in that don't want to believe, and they leave not believing in God, but they all walk out the door arm in arm saying, dude, I knew there were aliens. Isn't that crazy, man? Aliens gave it to her. Like, okay, call it aliens. Where'd they come from? Who made the aliens? Ah, right, right. To be alone. <laughs> right? And uh, the, the last argument, which I think is, um, I think it's the weakest intellectually, 
but I think that it's the strongest emotionally. And if and if you're going to admit that atheism nowadays is more emotional than intellectual, then you have to use this argument. And that's something called that's that's the moral argument, the moral approach. Where in the world do objective moral values come from if there are objective moral values? If they say there are not objective moral values, then you can do some mental gymnastics to basically prove to the person saying that they don't believe in moral moral objective values that they really do. Okay? And we don't have time for that either, unfortunately. Okay? But I think just to summarize, just to summarize, okay? Summarize. We have no proofs, just evidence. First cause, even the biggest atheists writing the books Universe from Nothing realize that to say the universe came from nothing is ridiculous. You can't say the universe came from nothing. Okay? Their theories about where it came from don't hold water, not philosophically, not mathematically, not, not uh, scientifically. That's number one. First cause. Whatever created this finite universe had to have been infinite, infinite, beyond time and space, and clearly had the mind of a creator and designer. Number two, the design itself. Even if you'll say that the universe design is not fair because there's nothing to compare it to because we only have one universe, which excludes the multiverse argument of the atheists, still you're stuck with life and DNA, which they have no idea where it came from, and DNA itself clearly is a book written by an author. That's what it is. That's what DNA is. There's no two ways around it, okay? Can you talk like a minute about DNA? I'm, the, I'm not the best person to speak to about it, but I can direct you to sources that talk about it, okay? That's number one. Number two, evolution is not a way out of DNA because there simply isn't enough time for all of this to have evolved naturally. And for that, you can look at the greatest molecular biologists as they, the humble ones amongst them will admit that. There's no way, okay? Um, Number three is Mamet Har Sinai. Number four is, uh, just look at the Torah, no human being could have written it. Number five is the moral argument, which I wish we had more time for. We got a little bit stuck in the beginning with very good questions. And I'll leave you with um, a quote from Francis Bacon, who is the father of modern science, the inventor of the scientific theory, the founder of what's called empiri- empiricalism. Okay, empiricism. He writes the following. A little philosophy inclines man's mind to atheism. But depth in philosophy brings men's minds about to religion. And that's really the difference between a a maimon and a person who is fighting it. And that is that anybody who claims that they know there's no God, they they must show you evidence there's no God. To know something, you need evidence. So if they say there's no God, so you ask them for evidence that there is no God. Now, no intellectual person will ever say, here's evidence there's no God. They'll just say, I don't have evidence there is a God. So therefore, it's illogical and emotional con- to conclude there is no God. Exactly, exactly. And therefore, you say to them, you don't have evidence there's no God. That's okay. You don't have to believe in God. I have evidence of what looks like that there has to be a God. It's more reasonable than not to say there's a God. Listen to my evidence and then decide for yourself. Don't use the word proof because it puts people in a defensive. Just say, I have evidence. Here's five pieces of evidence. They themselves are very deep and the greatest scientific minds, historians, philosophers, agree that these are serious challenges. If you want to hold on to a meaningless existence where there's no God, there's no creator, there's no designer, even though there seems to be one through all observable means, then that's your prerogative. You're, you're free to do that. But you have to realize that it's emotional, it's not intellectual. Yes. So yes. 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 And the amazing thing is, is that, and Rabbi Tatz has an amazing safer about this called, called "As Dawn Ends the Night." I highly recommend you you look into it. Rabbi Tatz writes that basically we're in Ikvus of the Mashiach right now, where we're at the end of the line, and God's actually doing less of a job hiding Himself than ever, with all the science that's out there nowadays. The greatest scientific minds are realizing, right, there's very little to hold on to anymore. When someone mentions multiverse, you just kind of just walk away. Because they're not dealing with things that you can really even argue. Okay? It seems like, like the two... Yeah. The two arguments, Last question, yeah. The two big arguments that we discussed today, like, it can make you understand that there's different traits of God, like God is infinite and God is a designer. So does that mean that for every trait of God that we want to say exists, we have to have some kind of proof for that would say that he is that? (laughs) 
No. No, for sure not. So how you get to those different... If you say, fine, if someone will say, fine, I agree, he's infinite, he's a designer, so how could you say, like, he's merciful? Like, where does that come from? So that's really what the Gemara says, is that you can't praise God any way you want to. You have to use the attributes that God himself related to us. Meaning, we never explain God by what God is unless God himself told us in his Torah, through his Nevi'im, that that's what he is, so to speak. All we say is, the closest description of God that we have in Lashon Kodesh is how the Mikubalim des- describe him as Ein Sof. Everything we've just been discussing is Ein Sof. And then Hashem is the was, is, and always will be. Right? Those are the most accurate descriptions of all we know about Hashem Be'etzim. Everything else is just Hanhagas Hashem. It's how we perceive Hashem in this world. That's it. It's not Him Be'etzim. Right? The Navi tells us, Ani Hashem, Ani Lo Shanisi. I'm Hashem. I can't change. There's no, I have no arena for change. Change implies flux. Flux means there's nothing here now and we're moving into a state. I'm getting angry. I wasn't angry before. I'm getting happy. You're giving me nachas. I didn't have nachas before. All these things are just anthrop- anth- anthropomorphism that we can wrap our brains around Hashem. But really Hashem is this. And that's another problem with talking about God is that our idea of God is something that we can't really fathom and we're okay with that. I don't want a God that I can understand. I would not worship a God that my feeble mind can understand. The people that do, like Richard Dawkins, who says, if my mind can't understand it, not only will I not worship it, but it doesn't exist, is coming purely from ego, purely from emotions. Yeah? So it's, it's a good point. Okay. Shukura. Nobody knows how long. 
It had to. It had to come into existence. And why do you think like I, like I speak with five mills about? He said he said that the proof, like creation is not really true like, because of that thing. There was only you can't like measure it against that. Thing. He said like scientists accept that reason also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they say that the universe seems to be designed, right? But it's not a proof. And I said it's not a proof because the he was arguing that there's only one universe. You can't compare it to anything else. You can't use statistics to show what it's possible. But life could use statistics. When it comes to life, when it comes to life, you know that there's non-life and there's life. So now there's what to compare to. The chances of life coming into existence alongside our lives. You know what I mean? Like, um, Adam is just not molecule. He's actually like that. You're taking it up because you're going to start with your man. What's your email? You just said you were going to be a man. Yeah. Excellent job. So much to do. It's Pasha, not Gumar Rashi Tosin. I'll tell you that. So Pasha is an Amish dude. Okay, everyone please take one seat per person. Thank you. Same seat. Thank you. 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 Thank one of the things I take very seriously is your time. Tonight we start a little later. It's very important. This whole seminar runs smoothly so everyone gets a good night's sleep because everyone knows what time does morning Seder start? Everyone knows that my sure the answer to this question. The night before, right? Morning Seder starts the night before. So good night's sleep. It's very important. Everyone please take a seat.